First of all, I just wondered how long does um, something have to persist to count as, a, as an epoch? I mean, if we um, carry on the way we are, we may very well be extinct in a very short time. Would that still count as, as an epoch or would it just be a blip in the, um, in the proceedings? That, that, that's my... Yes. Um, yeah. that's, not, that's not a ramble, that's a good question. It's a okay. wonderful <laughs> question. It, it's a superb question. Yeah. Yeah. And, and let's say, you know, there's this idea of you know, Osmandias, you know, the, 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 you know the, the, these ruins of this magnificent empire, and, and then you know, uh, it, it, it decays and then nothing, nothing is left. And, and that would be the idea that I probably had as a student, as a geology student, you know, that we have these structures, humans disappear, and then you know, nature takes over and the world goes back to its usual course. I think what is now clear is that even if we all disappear tomorrow, you know, or tonight before the tubes finish, <laughs> um, then uh, the world has been changed for good forever, and that is a change we will see in strata, you know, even a billion years in the future. It, it, it is rather like, I think, um, uh, being, uh, coming to the Earth 10 years after the meteorite impact that landed on the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. Uh, and then there would have been lots of changes. You know, lots of things would have gone, like dinosaurs, mammoths have gone and so on. Uh, you would not know how the world would be turning out, but you'd know it would be very different from the world of the dinosaurs of the Mesozoic. And I think that's the state we're in. You know, the world will not go back to its Holocene state. That's an omelette that won't be unscrambled. We don't know how it will evolve, but it will evolve into something different. And of course, how it will evolve, as, as Christian said, is, is partly, you know, uh, to a large extent, in our hands. Can I ask both authors yeah. here? Um, if the world goes before we get to the tube tonight, um, <laughs> uh, I'd be afraid, I'd be very afraid. Um, and there are no, the, it's the humans that go, everything else stays. What, What's the, what, what goes first of our, of our great civilization? What oh. goes first and what lasts the longest? What, so if aliens come in 100 years and then 1,000 years and then maybe 10,000 yeah. years, what will, they, what will they see and what will they find uh, that we've left behind? What will be our markers for posterity, as it again, were? Again, yeah, great question, again. And, and again, you can really divide it into three. There's our physical objects, you know, they are, you know, the, you know the, the, you know, the Royal Institution here, the, this object and, and the rest of it, and, and Shanghai and the rest of it. Part of that, that will simply stop being made. The, the technosphere will come to grind to a halt. Uh, um, and part of it will be fossilized. If you're in New Orleans, you probably will be fossilized. If you're in San Francisco, you probably won't be, because the crust is going up and being eroded. Um, but that is, is something that will come to a halt. The chemistry now, if you like, you know, the, the carbon dioxide event we're creating, and the climate change event, we know from past experience that there will be a, a rise in temperature and ocean acidification, uh, and then before those gases are absorbed, that will probably take of the order of one to 200,000 years, you know, before climate gets back to some sort of baseline, a slightly raised baseline than before, but still it will go up like that. And that's happened, oh, at least a dozen times before on the Earth with a great expulsion of, of greenhouse gases. Uh, the biology is for, for, for good, for keeps. Once you change biology, once you remove a species or you successfully transplant the species, you will then change the whole of biological history forever. You know, and the way that you know, the biology was changed forever at, at the, the KT boundary impact in Mexico at the end of the Cretaceous. So we, we have these, if you like, three different levels of permanence that we, we have in the Anthropocene. I mean, the cat, obviously the cats and rats start, start to do badly because they can't exist without us. Oh, uh, they probably do. Pretty, rats will do pretty well. Even oh, our yes. cats, I think, they they are uh, they're smart. Their cats will, do will really also well, not do badly. Right? I think they, they become... can, There's lots of feral cats around. Yeah, yeah that's true. If it's like my cat, it will do fine. <laughs> yeah. 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 And like Jan famously said in a Berlin meeting, that the cats of today they run around free. They will become the tigers of the future <laughs> in <laughs> evolution. Right? Not my cat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he put a cat on stage there that made me totally allergic, and I had to run out of the conference hall. Um, I think what would go First, what will go first is money, um, yeah. because uh, what is now so important to us um, just exists on computers anymore. It's, it has no yeah. physical base. Yeah. Um, I mean, of course, the gold that's in um, 
here and Frankfurt and New York and so on, that will persist, but um, it's only such a small part of what makes up the global money supply now, and most of it is lives in, in algorithms, so they will be gone very fast. And um, what lives longest? Um, perhaps the plastic bones uh, we give to the dogs now, and they will be found then in the future. And so they, some of them are really colorful, and some, somebody will wonder who, which organism was that? Right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the tunnels, of course, that uh, Jan highlighted. I mean, th these future visitors, they might think that we were incredibly large worms that kind of <laughs> ate their way through uh, the geology. With rubber bones. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Fantastic. Yeah. 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 Well, it's sobering that, the, 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 if you like, the, the, the range, if, if you classify you know, the, uh, objects as fossils, as trace fossils, as techno fossils, by the standard classical criteria, uh, then uh, my guess is that by some way, the diversity of our techno fossils is greater than the whole of the rest of biological diversity on Earth at the moment. You know, if, if you take 30 or, or even 100 million living species, uh, we are bound to have more than that of different sorts of objects that we have created. Uh, when you think that most a trilobite makes three types of traces, um, it, 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 it walks, it crawls, or it, 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 it burrows. And that's doing well. Uh, we are making orders and orders of magnitude more. You know, it is really a phenomenon, this. You know, the rubber bone is a phenomenon. Wonderful. Right, so we had some more questions. Don't you think it's going to be easier to um, <clears throat> have a consensus agreement, or at least understanding um, on what is already a rather uh, controversial uh, reference for a, a massive change in um, perceiving reality, to have a number of different events, perhaps some in uh, the cultural um, world, some in the technical, some biospherically, and some where those um, uh, previous spheres, if you will, are influencing planetary yeah. geology. And um, similarly, there was a chart up there with um, different energy uh, consumptions and production going over the course of time. Um, have a, a cumulative perspective to define and to come to an agreement uh, or a, a consensus understanding as to, to when the Anthropocene, or the, the human age, if you will, um, has begun. Yeah. Fine. Christian? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a very good point you make that the Anthropocene is uh, such a complex thing and it's, 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 it's fed by so many factors. And um, I think geology is really uh, challenged um, in perhaps thinking beyond it, the, its classical way of um, dealing with things. And you described it as bureaucratic and I think there's a very good reason uh, that this is so and, and perhaps that should be uh, uh, um, kept, but perhaps it could be added because we now have something like neurogeology in a sense, where our brains <coughs> and our minds and the geology of Earth come together and, and be, start interacting so massively that, yes, so it would be good to think about uh, a kind of um, classification system that reflects the complexity of, of the situation. Yeah. Yeah, geologists cope with that kind of thing by having different classification systems. You know, so we have, um, let's say, for fossils, we have biozones and biostratigraphy of, of different sorts and subzones and, and such like. We have different sorts of, of chemical zones. We have magnetic zones and so on. And all of these interweave and intertangle. And if you like, the, the time boundary is a simplification you know, of the ones which we deem to be the most important. So it's a simple, you know, the Anthropocene is we simply have to select a simple framework and realize it's going to be terribly complicated internally. Now, as Christian said, we are challenged by the complexity. And I think we're, we're challenged even more because when we look at, at Earth history in the past, we look at drivers of Earth history. And those drivers tend to be things like, oh, enormous uh, volcanic eruptions, uh, which pour out lots more CO2 than usual and so change the climate and so on and so on. We have to try and get our heads around that. Or the meteorite impact. You know, or you know, some sort of, of continental collision that, that changes ocean currents uh, around it. Now we have a, a, a change in Earth history which is driven by the collective activity of humans. Now, I don't even understand one human, let alone humans working together. So we have a completely different driver, and you're quite right. It's, it is making history both much more rapid so the evolution of the technosphere has decoupled completely from our biological evolution, and it's going on orders of magnitude faster. 
How do we cope with that? And the answer is with difficulty. And, and by trying to work with our colleagues you know, in the arts and the humanities, you know, um, you know, in the social sciences, you know, to put together you know, some sort of initial idea of, of how to tackle this. You're, it's not easy. You know, um, this is what we tried in, in Berlin with the, what, what was called the Anthropocene Project. And interestingly, in, interestingly it was uh, financed directly by the German parliament. And, and more interestingly, actually, actually, it was financed by the budget committee of the German parliament. So when I <laughs> heard this first, that we will get the money straight from the uh, parliamentarians who normally are the most, uh, 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 most strict about um, keeping the money where it, it is, not spending it. And the budget committee gave us uh, um, a very good um, sum to explore this idea. This was very meaningful for me because it told me that politics is interested to discover what this means yeah. for society. And, um, and then we used the resources we had um, in, to bring together um, geologists like Jan with uh, um, humanities scholars, for example, with artists, with technology practitioners, and um, exploring the complexity of it. And I think everybody had to get out of his comfort zone. And this was a good thing. I think at the beginning, uh, in the first meetings, uh, we first had to find a kind of uh, common language, and it almost took two years to find that common language. And uh, I think we're, it has caused a lot of collaboration and ended with an Anthropocene curriculum um, that brought together different disciplines. So it's a an, it's an still ongoing process. Um, and as the Anthropocene will last for a while, we still have some time to, to explore it. Right. Next, please. Can I... Thank you. I just wonder how far the Anthropocene extends, considering the fact that um, man's landed on the moon, but we've sent probes to various uh, planets and, uh, and comets, so is it restricted purely to Earth, or is it wherever mankind has touched in the solar system? <laughs> Right. That's great. I mean, yeah. uh, think of that yeah. uh, comet that's, what, 500 million <coughs> kilometers away, and it is now part of, officially part of the technosphere through mm. the, the probe that has uh, landed there. Isn't that amazing, really? So yes, it does extend beyond, beyond Earth, and certainly uh, Moon um, and Mars already uh, have been impacted in, in ways, so they are part of it. And who knows where else in the future we will extend uh, our... Um, uh, reach and and all of that will then have become part of the Anthropocene. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's not quite unique in in uh, in the sense that we do have meteorites on Earth which have come from Mars, and, and it's quite clear they've come from Mars because their chemistry, you know, clearly indicates that. You know, so there is interplanetary contact, but in the sense of it being, uh, if like, directed contact. Now that again is something quite new. Again, geologically. Um, if you, Mars has its own stratigraphy. It has its own names. It doesn't have the Cambrian and the Carboniferous and so on. It has the Amazonian and the Hesperian and, and, and so on, as has the Moon. Uh, so again, geologists have to struggle with this idea of extending what we call correlative links across space, you know, which are now beyond onto Titan, in fact, you know, with mm -hmm. the Huygens yeah. lander um, in, in there. Uh, so again, it's it's a it's a fascinating point, and if that develops, you know, if you know we get the world of Dandere in a couple of generations to come, uh, that will clearly grow this this you know interplanetary link, you know, mm. which will have its serious geological, you know, it will be have its material geological aspects. Mm. Yeah, the research Paul Crutzen did, I mean, he was the first person to discover the substances that uh, are dangerous for the ozone layer. Um, so he already, with that work, extended the Anthropocene uh, to the upper layers of the, of the atmosphere. Of course, if you think of space debris um, kind of encapsulating mm -hmm. uh, Earth already uh, with a technological layer, um, that, that is, of course, also part of the Anthropocene. And it's very long-lasting, as we know. So I hope that the aliens you wanted to visit us, that they haven't spent 10,000 years traveling here, and then they want to land on Earth and get hit by a piece of space <laughs> debris, that would not be a very nice Anthropocene welcome. Um, yeah. Slightly so, ironic, for sure, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, another question, please. Uh, so my question is about the, you had the pictures of the, the large cities. Now, 
bigger cities use proportionally more energy than smaller cities. And repurposing cities to be part of the ecosphere is also going to take a huge amount of energy. <clears throat> but one of the first slides we saw was effectively a peak oil forecast. The energy peaks yes. and then declines. And I wonder how you think the likelihood of us having less energy in the future is going to mesh with the fact that we're probably going to need more energy in the future if we want to try and undo the damage that we've, uh, that we've done so far. Mm. Mm. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. Um, mm. well, well, to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, yes, um, clearly we're using enormous amounts of energy. Uh, we, we, we could not exist otherwise. You know, we, we uh, use part of that energy, uh, let's say, to take nitrogen out of the atmosphere uh, and put it into the Earth, uh, and we've hyper-fertilized the Earth. You know, not only are we one-third, you know, plus our, our creatures two-thirds you know, of land vertebrates, the total amount of those has um, increased by about an order of magnitude by comparison with an actual baseline. And that is being kept suspended up there um, in, you know, in this kind of gigantic way uh, by energy in particular. And of course, we exist in all kinds of parts of the world um, where we normally could not buy the use of large amounts of energy, that is not going to stop. So if we're going to keep ourselves at something like this level, we're going to have it to expend energy. And, and uh, so I guess, again, this is very much Christian territory. We're going to have mm. to get different sources of energy and less damaging, less, if you like, um, planetary perturbing sources of energy than, than 500 million years of buried hydrocarbons yeah, to uh, do that. So, I mean, ultimately, this idea of city, cities that uh, think like planets, it reflects the idea that this invisible metabolism city have, uh, cities have, um, extending the reach of the city far beyond its boundaries, extracting resources from far away, that that kind of shrinks and cities become more self-sustaining. Um, now, first of all, I think I see a huge potential. Um, I mean, I kind of was critical about efficiency, but um, because I think efficiency alone will not solve that problem. But I mean, if I go to the uh, US, for example, and go into meeting rooms there, and they are cooled down to 15 degrees in the middle of the summer, I kind of turn blue, <laughs> and people put on sweaters in the middle of the, the summer, and they bring their winter jackets in the middle of summer. I think if you started to switch off um, these things, uh, which take an awful lot of energy, already you would kind of lighten the energy uh, footprint. Uh, a city like that has. And I think we have been very complacent about the whole ener energy question because of the Holocene um, treasure, um, and, and actually a treasure that goes uh, f f much further back, uh, 300 million years, the fossil fuels we can just extract, which are very energy dense. Um, and, um, and we've been complacent about thinking about alternatives. Um, I just spent last week in Denmark uh, doing research for an article on the rise of wind energy. And uh, it was fascinating there to see how kind of local ingenuity um, um, made possible that, that revolution that, that is now in Denmark, supplying the country with 40% of its electricity. And a lot of countries now go, go that way, Germany uh, included. And it brings up a lot of controversial questions. But um, it's just amazing to see how little research um, has been, be, been done in this. And that we still, and this is a figure I still can't believe, but it comes from the International Energy Agency in Paris, which is a very conservative body, uh, nothing environmental and, and so And the, the, uh, the agency has calculated that we give 500 billion, we meaning, we is always a prob problematic word. In that case, it's the world's governments. They give $500 billion annually in subsidies to the production and sale of fossil fuels, whereas green sources of energy, renewable energy, they get $100 billion in subsidies. So still, despite all the problems we know are caused by the consumption of fossil fuel, Governments spend five times as much subsidizing fossil fuels than renewables. And this research gap I talked about, also identified by the International Energy Agency, that we really, in order to become more energy efficient and self-sustaining in the cities, we need to spend a lot of money. So we need societies 
asking for energy research to be a top priority, not something that comes uh, at the end of the day in, in political deliberations, but right at prime time. Um, and this doesn't happen yet. So um, I think there is so much potential in renewable energy that really is um, environmentally friendly um, that I wouldn't be concerned about the city of, of the future. Um, if research is supported um, in a way, uh, on a level, um, it should be. Oddly enough, not a topic that's been mentioned much in our general election hustings of... Uh, <laughs> um, very good question, great answers, thank you. Um, anybody else up there want to wave? Question. Yes. Right, in the right in the back? Right in the back. Yeah. Right in the back. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if we can assume that we're not in the Anthropocene right now, and that a new era is defined by a change in human behaviour, um, would you say that the key to sustainability is reducing our complexity and going almost back in time or becoming more complex and going for more ecological ways of life? Yeah. yeah. Oh, no. Well, uh, back in time, I mean, in the environmental movement, there is, nos there is this nostalgia uh, about uh, good old times. Um, mm. And it's an interesting, uh, when people really define, like, uh, a baseline for um, conservation, for example, what sort of nature do you want to conserve? Is it the nature of the 19th century? Mm. Or is it the nature of 5,000 years ago, or 10,000, or 100,000 years ago? And it's really difficult. Um, so I think we can draw a lot of inspiration from past practices, and, and probably uh, a lot of uh, wonderful uh, cultural techniques have been lost and need to be rediscovered. Um, including, for example, the ability to do things yourself manually, you know, to create things, to build things, um, and uh, to be self-sustainable in, in, in that sense. Uh, um, but the nostalgia element of environmentalism, it can kind of inspire a little bit, but I think it's, it doesn't take us that far. Um, and, and what I really would like the environmental movement to bring up is not only nostalgia and apocalyptic warnings, but kind of good ideas how the future might play out. Um, and, and I don't mean sort of um, compulsively optimistic stuff that is looks like PR, but where could we go? What could be alternatives? You know, what, how could a future uh, look like? I try to at least formulate some challenges we have. And I think uh, the belief in a better future, I mean, that is the driving force behind progress. And that promise has been uh, about modernity itself. But, but that promise seriously has been broken in, in the past uh, years. And um, so we need a sort of new modernity discussion, actually. And the definition of growth and progress, all these words that are so important in the discussions, that perhaps we reformulate them to include what are the Anthropocene challenges. So I would not say we need to go back to some past. Uh, we need really to go uh, forward, but we can be inspired by our uh, past. Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a, you know, there are so many words, aren't there, out there, which, which are at cross purposes. So sustainability, that gives the idea that we're, go we're going to reach something and they're going to stay there forever. Whereas the reality is that uh, things are changing now faster than they've ever changed, you know, in, in that, uh, in all kinds of parameters. Uh, so somehow, as Kristen said, we've got to ride that tiger uh, and, and make it work with as much benefit and as least, least harm as, 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 as we can do that. Um, and, and, you know, there's simply some very simple things. You know, if, if we can wean ourselves away from fossil fuels, uh, we may be able to avoid the worst of the climate effects and the worst of the sea level change that's going to happen. Uh, and, and that, you know, very simple to a geologist, you know, carbon tax, you yeah. know, and uh, a switch of subsidies. Uh, and then, with that, one might be able to, you know, design some path through the changes that are inevitably going to happen. You know, some amount of sea level is going to happen, we're going to have to live with that. Um, that is going to give a lot of people a, a lot of work to actually rebuild our lives a, a little bit higher up you know, up, up on the landscape. And there's going to be a lot of work to do, you know, and, and not all of that is going to be bad. You know, part of that is, you know, um, it's going to be very good for fish. They are going to have a little bit more space <laughs> to live in. One thing I'd really like to happen in the future is that we invent uh, an Earth Destruction Day um, and um, celebrate it every year. So we are 
sustainable, environmentally friendly for 364 days a year. And then we have this one day where we can run around and destroy <laughs> things. Um, today, it's the other way around, right? <laughs> we have Earth Day and we switch off the lights and everything. And the rest of the year, well, <laughs> perhaps we should try and turn that around. That yeah. would be a good thing to have in the future, Earth Destruction Day. Yeah. Or you can burn coal just for that yes. one day. One day, that just yeah, yeah, one day, yeah, yeah. you're allowed to do anything you like. You can pollute, pollute that light you, can, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can hunt uh, the rarest animal and everything, but <laughs> then, <laughs> next day, back to normal. Let the cat out. Back to Anthropocene normal, that would be good. That's a very good idea. <laughs> uh, we're getting close to the end, 10 minutes to go. Come on, somebody there, I think. If somebody else feeling, feeling missed out, somebody definitely there. Like moving on from um, talking about the terminology of things, how important do you think it is to formalise the term the Anthropocene when talking about um, like international um, legislation and politics with regards to climate change issues? And we mentioned carbon tax, for example. Ah, ah, well, that is, yeah, yeah, that is. You, you've touched on uh, probably the thorniest question of all uh, in in that we are having to deal with. Um, in formalising the Anthropocene, um, there are two things. One, it's got to be real. Uh, and I think we're establishing that it's geologically real. Uh, and then there's a question of, OK, it's real, but there are lots of real terms out there which are, are not formal time terms. You know, for instance, the Precambrian, well known used by every geologist, is not a formal part of the time scale, even though everybody uses it. The tertiary. Also, the Cretaceous tertiary impact and so on is not a formal part of the time scale, even though every geologist understands it uh, in there. Uh, so there is a big, big question uh, around what is the use of formalizing the Anthropocene? Now, in the past, all those questions were simply there by geologists for geologists. Nobody else was involved you know, with the, the Carboniferous and the Silurian and the Devonian and so on. Um, and here, what has happened is that the question of formalization has become important to all kinds of other communities, um, including, let's say, you know, colleagues we have who are looking at international law of the sea, uh, who are using the Anthrop Anthropocene as a basis to re redesign future law. Um, now, that is without precedent in geology. Uh, and I think a lot of my colleagues in geology, um, that is something that is going to take a little time to settle it in and for them to be comfortable with, that the geological time scale, which is very much the backbone of that particular science, if you like, their possession, suddenly mm -hmm. has an element to it which extends far beyond and where that element might actually want to have part of the say uh, or might be held to have some legitimate interest in the question of formalizing or not that part of the time scale. Mm. And I think that is the most difficult thing we have as a working group to deal with. Mm. It, it makes the geology simple by comparison. You know, this question of uh, what and why and who is it for and what good will it do? And when are you going to decide? And when are we going to decide it? Yeah. 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 Right. But it's already, I mean, that the Anthropocene as an idea inspires uh, politics. Um, so it's not only the German parliament that was interested in it. For example, Ban Ki-moon, uh, United Nations Gen uh, Secretary General, he opened the last uh, Rio Environment Summit with the words, welcome to the Anthropocene. So what you, what you can see is that this is something that is not, you know, that is at the moment really becoming viral in a sense. When I wrote the first edition of, of the book in German, that's only five years ago, um, I was really not sure whether this idea would be a you know, something interesting or cul de sac um, in terms of the public debate. And now it's, you know, at the highest political level. It's uh, taken seriously and it's discussed and, and, and explored. And when the, the English edition now um, uh, was to be published, I realized I had to rewrite basically the whole book because so much had happened in the, in the political debate also. So I think the formalization that um, what's Jan's job in terms of the hard science, that's, that's one aspect, but already the kind of metaphorical, inspirational uh, level. And Paul Crutzen is totally amazed by what this one word really has uh, started, um, it's already underway and it's kind of taking on a life of its own almost, yeah. right? Yeah. What we can do is work, we have no power. We're, we're right at the very bottom rung of every possible hierarchical body, you know, uh, in, in there. We're a working group of a subcommission, of a commission of the International, uh, International Union. Um, 
what we can do, and I, th I see our job is doing, is trying to make sense of the Anthropocene, to see what the evidence is, to see whether it works or it doesn't work, um, uh, and then to help define it. So if the word is out there, it should be used in roughly the same word by different people, so it, it, it simply becomes part of the lingua franca of, 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 in fact, of discourse in general rather than just science. And one of the, the, the criteria for accepting um, a new epoch is its usefulness, it's right? Its usefulness, So yeah. I think that that's been... Proven already? It's, yes, but I think the usefulness, because the usefulness extends so far outside, mm. uh, the people who make the decisions, who are formal stratigraphers, you know, who deal with the whole time scale, um, again, this will be something, quite a new situation for them. Uh, and I myself don't know whether they will see that as a good thing, that an Anthropocene is out there being used by all kinds of people, you know, or something where they see that as undue influence of the world outside upon the business of the geologists. It's a, and I can't predict how that's going to go at all. all. It's slightly too late, isn't it? I mean, we're it's sitting in this room talking yes. about it. Yeah. They can't yeah. say, well, it didn't happen. They, no, but what they can say is that this term is out there. It's very useful. The science is great and all that. We, we understand all of that. Uh, but it is premature on a geological basis to formalize it. Mm -hmm. I, I can, I, simply because, you know, it, the word came out 2000. <coughs> um, the, the geologists caught up. <laughs> Eventually, <laughs> you know, in, in yeah. around about 2007, yeah. we published our first paper from the, the, the National here, the Geological Society of London, yes. 2008. The working party, the working group formed in 2009. Um, we've, we've had, what, a bit over five years. Now, normally it takes a couple of decades to put on the kettle to think about you know, <laughs> the evidence you know, in these discussions. Uh, geology is complicated, and, and so there's a reason for that. You know? uh, and so um, things, the Anthropocene is quick in all ways, including the formal process. And again, that is maybe, you know, it will be regarded in, in some way as, as trying to run before we can walk mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in this thing. Yeah. Which is not to say that you know, the science is Gen you know, Paul Crutzen at his 80th, you know, you know um, he, what he said to me, you know, as we're, we're chatting, he said, he's well aware of, of the series of the Anthropocene, yeah. but he said, it's beautiful science. Yeah. And it, it, is rem it is fascinating and completely novel science, you know, um, uh, you know, and all the things that Christian has described in the way that, it, you know, we are even now affecting, influencing the course of Earth history. Mm. You know, that is remarkable mm. science. And it's re remarkable also that uh, Paul Kutzen is uh, the most uh, open about what it is. I, mm. it was, uh, I, I picked him up at an airport a couple of years ago, and the first thing he said when he got into the car was, uh, uh, Christian, the Anthropocene, what, what really is it? I don't mm. know, he said, right? Mm. So I think that is from you know, a Nobel laureate. It's a very bold statement um, who coined the mm. word, right? Mm. Uh, but it's a very meaningful um, statement um, because it expresses that nobody has the authority to define really what it is. It is something we all do together. That, that is a very different mm. thing. Right, I'm aware that we've got time for one last question to the uh, gentleman there. Well, I'm not sure about the pressure of the last question, but uh, <laughs> I wondered whether Sorry. we could uh, pull a little bit of discussion back towards some of the other species other than ourselves uh, that we're driving to extinction in an alarming way and, and the loss of, yeah. of the ecosystem services and other values that we put on those species. Um, and just ask the speakers whether they think the Anthropocene, bringing it more into a kind of cultural context and a kind of a, a conscript of how we're looking forward as to whether it might allow us to start um, bringing to together the idea of natural capital into its own and make people think seriously that this is something we have to bring into our daily decision making. Okay. Yep, good question. Yeah. Well, um, I, I made a very um, um, provoking description in, in the book uh, when I wrote that um, the tigers and um, the rare plants and uh, they are like the uh, pets or like the plants we have at home you know, where our care needs to extend. Of course that's a bit anthropocentric but if you look at the resources people spend on their pets and then take a situation where our care extends to um, the species that are uh, wild, you know, if you extend that, that care that could 
set free uh, enormous resources. And I mean, if we don't care, we will feel it. So it, it is, uh, I mean, we are cutting the net we lie on, right, every day. And um, the, the Anthropocene um, will be a ridiculous uh, epoch uh, if, we, if we focus the attention uh, on us. So I think it will help us to really look outside um, and to um, and, and start develop much closer um, caring um, relationships. Uh, but first of all, you have to um, let it kind of act uh, on what, I mean, the love you have for a pet, and then think, you know, of the of the tiger, for example. That this this extension, that's a, another form of globalization in a sense. We now get things that are made, you know, at the in faraway countries. That's totally natural for us. So we need to start start. Um, kind of mirroring that in a care for things far away, and that that's not happening yet. Yeah, yeah. No, I quite agree, and and, and it should be made easier in some ways. The, the, the technosphere should bring us closer to all the other creatures, you know, all the other species that we, we share the earth with. And you're quite right. You know, the, the biosphere is the important thing. You know, the, 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 the Anthropocene is not just a synonym for, you know, for climate change. In fact, climate change. We are still in the Holocene climatically. Carbon dioxide isn't. Carbon dioxide is in Pliocene, but the Earth hasn't caught up. But what has, is changing, as you're quite right to say, is, is the biosphere, the, the, the net, and, and which, as far as we know, is unique in the known universe. There's nothing like it in the rest of the solar system. Most of the exoplanets we've discovered have no chance of having anything like this. You know, so developing a, you know, a sense of care, if you like, or even being old-fashioned, a sense of duty towards that, um, is, is clearly something that you know, we're going to have to develop to have anything that might be called a good Anthropocene in, in the future. Thank you both of our speakers for an absolutely wonderful discussion and really stimulating. Thank you. Thank you.